Uh, I, I swear I wasn't doing anything. Um, I, oh, thank God it's just you. Hi, uh, w welcome back to uh, Penumbra Overture. Okay, what was I doing? Let's see, I just turned on the Bunsen burner. Something in there. I know I need to make a chemical mixture. I've got all of my chemicals. I have a glass container, a fuse. Okay, so... The order I need to mix them in is B-A-D-C-F-E. So do I just drag it into it? No, not quite right. Alright, I probably put it on here first, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So... And I'm mixing this one with this. I don't think I did it right. Hmm. An insulated pipe running to the furnace. Must be gas. All right, let's read that note again. Actually, I did a hint that maybe I should check my explosives book. Let's do that. Man, that was a long time ago. Black match fuse. Don't need it. No. Dynamite. Don't have any of that stuff. Armstrong's mixture. <laughs> Is that what I'm going to be making? Okay. Um, sulfur can substitute for some or all of the barium. Okay, what do I have? Red phosphorus and barium or sulfur. Phosphorus and barium. Unfortunately, I can't put in the replacement chemical that would make it less prone to blowing my face up, which is unfortunate. Because apparently it's already very likely to do it, even in the safer mixture. It's only relatively safe. Shit. Let's try that again. Red phosphorus and barium or sulfur. Wait, was there sulfur there? Hold on. I'm gonna write it down. Red phos and barium or sulfur. Nope. Alright, so B and... Actually, you know what? Um, the B-A-D-C-F-E thing, that's probably telling me which order... These are in. Yeah, it's gotta be. Okay. So, in that case... The phosphorus... Would be... Two, three, four, five. Phosphorus would be F. Okay. And the barium is number three, which would be D. Let's try that. So F and then D. Ah, I think that's it. So long as I'm careful when I move it, it should stay stable. Okay. Playing with the explosives here. Let's save it first. As long as I'm careful. As long as I'm careful. It turns out the book wasn't wrong. It is highly volatile. <laughs> we. Okay. Wait, do I need a fuse? Wait, do I? I have a fuse. Hold on. Nice and gentle. Nice and gentle. Oh, it's already a fuse. A nice dry fuse. Okay. It's not a piece of string, it's actually a fuse.
Nice. Nice and easy. Nice, nice and easy. Oh, Jesus, I didn't... Fuck. I didn't do that on purpose. I swear I didn't do that on purpose. I seriously didn't. <sighs> okay. What? I... What? I didn't even hit anything that time. Does it blow up if you simply move it fast enough? Okay. Let's be extra careful. I've now blown this entire facility up. Wow. They weren't kidding about it being volatile. It doesn't even have to hit anything if you simply move it fast enough. Okay. Okay, okay. I can't even I can't even whip my view around or it'll explode. Okay. Okay. Now, do I just drop it? Okay, nice and easy. Good, it does it for you. And then... a fuse. And then we light it and run the fuck away. Time to go! It actually worked. Man, I gotta love how it blew all of the rocks that I wanted out of the way, out of the way, but it didn't even touch the walls. Amazing! I didn't know you could direct explosives so well just inside of a glass beaker. Strange looking. Is that is that the out is that the outside? This door, it's different, newer than all the others. This must be where Red's been leading me all this time. Is he behind there? Red? I hear machinery. Hold on, let's take a look around first. Locked. I can't get a hold of it. I need something to lever it open. Like what? I've located the locked door that Red has been leading me to. I need to get it open. I have a crowbar. It's hydraulically sealed. It won't just pry open. Maybe if I could cut the power. Okay. Gotta find the power. This is the ins you, you, you actually came. There is much that should leave my throat box now, but the words elude me. You came, you are so pretty, but I have been bad. The underworld already beckons me, so I suppose one further misdemeanor will change little. It is false pretension and not guiding light with which I have led you here. I cannot give you the answers you want. You may wish to find what it is you seek, but that is a fiction. You cannot know what it is you sought through the vast leaden doorway, or else you would seek anything else in the world. No, the key stays with me, in here, so the life that has led me, horrible as it may be, is better still than the life that waits for you, hungry behind those doors. As the placements go, you shall be admirably had normal. But you must wonder why this metal burning chamber is talking to you in a voice you knew only as red. For it is I, your companion, residing within. You see, I have waited for this day so many years. They won't let me die. They have parts of my head are not my own. And I cannot take my life. It is against the rules. Please, the pain has gone on for so long. 
All I wanted was a friend, but now the time for chit chats and marshmallows by the fire is ended, and I hope that soon uh, so shall my life. I have knocked on the death's door for so long. Please, let him invite me in for tea. He wants me to kill him. He wants me to incinerate him. Why would Red want me to kill him? Why like this? What can I do? Combustion meters, measuring temperature, humidity, and gas flow, among others. Vicious looking things, almost like meat hooks. They too look like meat hooks. Supply pipes. I have to kill him, don't I? I think I need to kill him. The key is inside. Damn it, Red. <sighs> All right. I guess I'll put him out of his misery. Red, I'm so sorry. Whatever happened to you down here, it's over now. God, that is really disturbing. Being burned to death is not a good way to go. Ashes. All that remains of my only friend down here. Now I'm all alone. No. It won't be for that. I need to cut the hydraulic power. It's got to be for this door. This is his room. Poor Red. I'm so sorry. You're at peace now. Red. Door. Liberty, liberty or death, I think that says? Let me die. Something is hurting. Ple oh, head is hurting. Please. There's a noose. He just wanted to die. But he couldn't. He said it's against the rules. What does he mean? Against what rules? Just something in his head that was preventing him from from being able to do it? I can see Red now, sitting here, guiding me. I probably wouldn't be standing here now if it wasn't for him. Why did he have to leave me down here alone? Young Red's predicament. My dearest friend. How are you? I am as well as can be expected. I have some sad news, though. A few days ago, there was some kind of collapse, and some of the ceiling of the cave fell in on me. What scares me is that I was in an off-limits part of the mine. 
They may not look for me here, but if they do, and they find me, I'll be in so much trouble. But I don't think I'll have to worry about that, because I'm not sure I'll be getting out of here. I don't mind so much. I've been working in the mine for about three weeks now, and I'm really proud that I can send money home. But it's pretty tough work, and so far you're the only person that's really been nice to me. Plus, I have some nice company down here. There's some friendly, kind of creepy crawlies, and some books I brought from home that I was taking to the rec room. If you think about it, I was really quite lucky I had all this stuff with me, otherwise I'd be bored stiff. As it is, I have Shakespeare, Bronte, uh, Nietzsche, or Ni how do you pronounce that? Ni Nietzsche? Nietzsche, I think. Uh, perfect bedtime reading, although I suppose I might be trapped here long enough that I have to read them twice. I always used to ask my mum how long people survive without food and things. I read how some people can survive underwater for over five minutes, and some people last in the desert for weeks, but she always said you had three minutes of air, three days of water, etc. I suppose I'll probably find out soon enough. I guess if I had to, I could find food around the place. Like I said, there's all sorts of creatures here. But they're better off as my friends than my lunch. I wonder whether I shall starve to death or go cave crazy first. Neither sounds too much fun, I guess. But if I had to choose, I'd say I'd want to go mad. It sounds like an adventure. Tom Redwood, Proper Mine Worker, December 1970. 1970? It's been at least 30 years, right? He's been surviving down here for at least 30 years? Age 14. Oh my god. That's amazing. That he's able to survive for so long. Where did he get that? Leaving out how Red, how Red managed to catch and kill this thing, it's quite clearly inedible. Poor guy must have been close to starving to death. How did he get that? It smells like a sewer. How did Red sleep on this? Maybe he just didn't sleep. You. Why am I touch why am I touching a soiled bed? Let's put it back in the corner. The chains on his arms are visible now. Not there out of choice. Father looks on aghast. He clutches some notes, shaking hands. He knows. He knows what has come. What the man has released. The only one who could stop it. Howard knows the real fear. Books and books and more books. He had a good collection. Although I imagine he's probably read all of them hundreds and hundreds of times. Reams of books. Where did Red scavenge all these from? There's everything from survival manuals to the collected works of Shakespeare and Kant's ethics. This was how he spent his time. No wonder he spoke so strangely. He must have led a lifetime of misunderstanding. That must be his bathroom. Jesus, from the stench. I think this may have been his toilet. I... Oh. Ew. Those are some creepy pictures. <laughs> or posters, rather. He tried. He tried and he wanted to, but he couldn't for some reason. How many hours did he spend with his neck in this noose? Just trying to end it all. A cage of slugs? No wonder he was getting hungry. What a final meal. 
ration to slugs. Still, knowing Red, perhaps he enjoyed them. Ooh. Sounds like power. It must be the uh, hydraulic. Yeah. Alright, um... Let's see, how do we do that? Electrics. And maybe running out to the door. Bolt cutters? That should do it. Well, goodbye, Red. Let's put this back the way I found it. Will it open now? I can't get a hold of it. I need something to lever it open. Okay, let's see if we can do this now. As I stepped into the mouth of the underground facility, there should have been questions, fears, doubts running through me. Instead, I was torn in two. Part of me, I felt, had died, along with my only ally and friend. His final words had raised more questions than they'd answered, and I couldn't get his screams for help out of my head, despite knowing deep down that the pain I'd caused Red was, itself, all the, all the help I could have offered him. I was alone again, but I had nothing to do other than press on into the unknown. If I'd felt so bad about Red, I should have listened to him and stayed where I was. I would trade his fate a hundred times for my own. The other side of me was looking forward, to what might await me in my continued journey. I felt sure that I would find some clue or other to my father's fate, and that he was inextricably linked to everything that was happening. I also couldn't help but suspect that everything I had seen up until that point was just symptomatic of whatever lay beyond the threshold. I know now I was right. Someone's left me a note. Welcome to the shelter. Established 1973, elevated cast, 4. Chief staff, 6. Lower cast, 39. Temporary, 8. Total population, 57. Okay, the Xeno research papers that I'd found mentioned casts. Key members. Chief Overseer, Wilbur Frisk. 80s to present. Or, yeah, 80. 1980 to present. Brent Stafferson. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if I recognize anything here. Hmm. Away team. Last updated, 2000. Please have your identity documents ready. The shelter. Strange. So when... Let's see, what was it? it was a In the 30s, it was a mine, right? And around the 40s, it was used as a base? A military base? Or was it the 50s that it was used as a military base? Hold on. Established 1973. To what mentioned the Xeno... There we go, Xeno reports. It's 1992, that's much later. Hmm. Something mentioned elevated cast. But what? I'm not sure what that would be. There's someone over there. There's someone down there.
With that, the man who had first descended into the mine was no more, and so began my next chapter. To be continued. <laughs> yeah, that was the end. Oh, that's the end. I remember people, um, I remember reading that people were really unsatisfied with the end, and as they should be, it is incredibly unsatisfying. It's just, like, you just get little hints of something to come. You know, there's a person in the distance, and you just read about the shelter, and then it just ends out of nowhere. Like, it doesn't, it just ends. It's so out of the blue and unsatisfying. But the good thing is there's no need to remain unsatisfied because the rest of the series is already out. So no need to wait for a sequel to come from like a year from now or something like that. But it's definitely a very unsatisfying end. Okay. Well, let's dig into it. I... Loved this game when I first played it, and I still do. And are the credits about to end? I think they're about to end, actually. Let's see if there's, um... Let's see if there's a scene after the credits before I dig into it. For more information on the next episode, put number over .com. Well, no need for that anymore. I see if anything happens. Nope, just goes to the main menu. Okay. Well, yeah, let's dig into it. So, I loved it before when I first played it. This was the first Frictional Games game that I played. I just started from their very first one. And I still love it even now. And it's really interesting to look at it, I think, compared to their newer games, especially Amnesia the Dark Descent. You can really see where they came from with this. You can see their roots, and you can see how, how similar it is compared to Amnesia. It's very similar. And in most ways, I think Amnesia the Dark Descent has improved upon this game. However, in in some in a few ways, I actually think Penumbra Overture is better, personally. But for the most part, Amnesia is definitely better. Um, so let's delve into, like, everything that's different and what's interesting about the game and just... Yeah, let me just analyze it a bit. Okay. So it's... I guess I'm going to mostly speak about it in comparison to Amnesia. I'm not really sure why, but for some reason I feel like that's appropriate. Because most of my thoughts are centered around that, for some reason. I don't know why. It's fun to compare things, though. Alright, so in terms of the physics... The physics system is basically the same as it is in Amnesia. They really haven't changed it very much. It still uses the same basic system where you actually grab things and have to pull open and closed doors and drawers and stuff like that. And there's a lot of physics-based puzzles that make use of that system. That's pretty much the same. I don't think they changed it very much for Amnesia. Um, Amnesia might have had a system in place that allows you to rotate objects when you're holding them and stuff like that. I think it might have. I can't remember. So they might have refined it a bit more, but the basic system is still the same. So they kind of pretty much nailed that system right from the beginning. In terms of... Well, one thing that's definitely different, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they even changed this in the second Penumbra, Penumbra Black Plague, is the combat. Simply the existence of combat. This game has combat. It has enemies that you can kill. Whereas Amnesia and I'm pretty sure the second Penumbra as well, do not. You can't fight back. You can't You can't hold a weapon. You can't swing a pickaxe or a hammer. And I think that's definitely a good idea. As you saw in this game, the combat is... It does a couple things. Well, for one, the combat is just poorly executed on its own. It's just not good combat. The weapons that you use, the way you have to actually swing them with your mouse, is kind... It's cool. It's, it's pretty cool. It feels more satisfying than just left-clicking and having an animation play. Because you have to actually kind of swing it. Even though it is, it, it, is, it is still just an animation, but... Just the fact that you actually activate that appropriate animation by actually doing the motion with your mouse 
is, is satisfying. But it doesn't work too well for the combat, and then also the fact that the combat is so easily exploitable by the fact that the dogs... I, I don't know what's up with the dogs. They just fall over. They become, like, paralyzed, and they ragdoll when you hit them once. And it has some weird effects. They ragdoll, and it makes them invulnerable to damage until they stand up again. Which is so bizarre, because you might have noticed the at least the one time, I think multiple times, where a dog had an explosive blow up right next to it, but it was, it was in the getting up animation. So it was simply invulnerable, and the explosive did no damage whatsoever, so I blew up the, the freaking dog and it did nothing? Like, that's absurd. It's, it's weird. It's bad because it leads to stuff like that, where you blow up a dog, you blow up an enemy and it doesn't do any damage, which makes no sense. And it's also incredibly exploitable, because if you time it right, if you can get one good hit off on one of the dogs, it'll fall over. And then if you time every other hit right, so that you hit it when it just comes up, the dog will never have a chance to hit you, because it's always just going to be falling over. It's really silly. It looks silly, it feels silly, it's just, it's not good. So that's one of the problems with the combat, is that it just isn't well done. But on top of that, the fact that it even has combat at all, even if it was well done, is, I think, a bad thing. And I think they realized that, which is why they removed it. And the reason because, and the reason for that is because when, uh, as soon as you put an, a weapon inside of a player's hand, be it a melee weapon, a, a knife, a board, or a gun, or anything like that, as soon as you do that, the player mindset changes, I think. It, it kind of change it, changes it into an action game. The player mindset, my, my mindset when I have something in my hand, is I'm going to kill stuff. I switch over to, like, thinking in terms of Half-Life and, you know, first-person shooters and stuff. It switches my mindset into an action mindset. I'm thinking about beating it. I'm thinking, how do I beat this enemy? And that's not a good mindset to be in when you want horror. It doesn't work for horror. It really doesn't work. Which is obviously something they've realized because they removed it from their future games. They have no combat. And that is totally the right move. It's not that you can't have an action game or you can't have combat and have horror together. Of course you can. There's, For example, well, there's so many examples, but one example would be System Shock 2, which... It is an action game. There's no doubt about that. It really is, at its core, it's an action, like an action RPG, I guess, sort of. Kind of. Like a first-person shooter RPG. But it mainly comes down to killing stuff. However, it's also a horror game. But it's not really... It's not all that... scary. It's... I don't think you can really have combat... in a horror game and have it be completely and utterly terrifying. Not really. I think if you do that, it, it ends up being an action game with kind of like a horror bent to it. Kind of like a bit of horror flavor, if you will. But it ends up not being really, at its core, about the horror. As soon as you start having combat, it just, it kind of takes over everything. It becomes an action game. So, so action doesn't ruin horror completely, necessarily, but it really takes away from it. So, I think it's definitely a good thing that they decided to remove it from their future games. So that's one interesting thing. Let's see what else. Um. Oh yeah. Another interesting change is how how the puzzles are designed. So in Penumbra Overture, there's both more puzzles, and the puzzles that you do have to do are also more kind of traditional and classical in their in their design. This game really is kind of like a classic. It's like a bunch of things mixed together. It's, it has sort of like a point-and-click classic adventure game feel to it in some ways, in some of the puzzles. But then it also has... Then they throw into the mix, they throw in horror and sort of like a first-person puzzle. Uh, I mean, not puzzle. First-person, like, physics-driven game. It's kind of all together. But you can definitely see classic point-and-click adventure game uh, influence in Penumbra, Penumbra Overture. There's a lot of puzzles. They're very classical, in many ways, in a bad way. For example, there's a, there's a lot of puzzles that are just really, really silly. Like the steam floor, a floor 
that shoots steam at regular intervals and it's a timed thing and certain squares don't have steam on them, so you have to figure out the pattern on how to run across the floor. Like, that makes no sense. Nowhere on Earth does that exist. It's... it's so dumb. It's so silly. It just takes you right out of the game, like, oh great, now I'm inside of a factory thing where you have these buttons that move up and down, these big mashy things in a factory that makes no sense, and we have a steam floor. It, like, what? It's so silly, and it does not belong in the game. It feels so out of place. It's... it's ridiculous. So, it's much more classical in its approach to puzzles, where they kind of just shove in puzzles, even though they don't make any sense within the universe, within the world, that it's set in. So there's much more of that, whereas in their future games, especially Amnesia, uh, my memory's more hazy on Black Plague. I really don't remember how they changed the puzzles, if at all, in Black Plague, but in Amnesia, definitely. The puzzles are... They're much more simple and straightforward, and they all make sense within the world. They really do. None, none of them feel shoved in for no reason. They just make sense. But that's not to say Penumbra Overture has all bad puzzles. They're not all classical and ridiculous and shoved in and out of place. No, a lot of them just make sense. And they're incredibly satisfying to do because the actions you have to do to do them are just... I, I think it's because of the physics system that a lot of what you do feels so satisfying in the puzzles. Simple things like you need to get through a gate and it's blocked by a piece of wood. So you get a saw and you saw the wood. That's not really, that doesn't really use the physics system at all, actually, so that's a bad example of what I was just saying, but it, that's an example of how simple and straightforward some of the puzzles are. It makes sense. You have something that's blocking you, you get the right tool to unblock it, and then you do it. Of course, that puzzle is also kind of silly, because you could have just reached your hand through the bars and just lifted up the board that was blocking the way, but let's not think about that part. And then other things, like you have the box that is too hard to break open with your hand, with any sort of a tool you have, so you shove it down a shaft, a really deep shaft, and it hits the bottom and explodes. Or not explodes, but breaks open and you can grab the battery. That makes sense. It's totally believable. It makes sense why you'd have to do that. It's logical and it's satisfying to do because it uses the physics system. You get to actually push a crate over the edge and watch it go boom at the bottom. That's really cool. And then all the other just, all the little physics puzzles just... And physics interactions, in general, turning levers and pressing buttons and whatnot. And just building, like, stacks of boxes and stuff to get over things. It's just really nice. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of practical puzzle solving, which I really appreciate. So it's both, it's, it's both a mixture of very strong practical puzzle solving that involves their unique physics system, and it's also a mixture of very classical sort of point-and-click adventure puzzles. So it's a strange mix, and one in which they they definitely improved in their future games, especially Amnesia. They've really tightened down on making all of their puzzles make sense in the world. Also, one other way in which Penumbra Overture is very sort of adventure game uh, influenced by classic adventure games is how wordy it is. It's It has a lot of words. There's a serious amount of writing at least one of the notes actually took me about 10 minutes to read. Which is much more wordy than Amnesia the Dark Descent was. I think Amnesia had a mod- I would say a moderate amount of notes, but the ones you did find were not- I don't think they were particularly long, certainly not as long as these. So that's one thing they've changed, but I'm not going to say they changed it for the better, because to be honest, I actually like the wordiness of it. If there's anything that I think you should take from classic adventure games, it's it's uh, writing and having all of this information and all of this description of the environments. So having these very long passages to read, I actually really enjoy it. I know a lot of people don't read notes. If you watch a lot of playthroughs, you'll probably see a lot of people just skip notes or they kind of like skim read it or something. A pretty common thing is that they just read it for the information that they need, like... They just skim it for a passcode or something, if there is a passcode inside of it. And... I don't know, I mean that... I don't really get that, I don't like that. That's not... that's not for me, I want to read every note. If it has... if it has some relevance to the story. If it's interesting in some way, then I want to read it. 
And it's just very wordy. And I like that. Uh, crap, there's something I was going to say about that I'm, that I'm forgetting. What am I forgetting? Uh, crap. What was it? It's about wordiness and reading notes and stuff. Well, yeah. I'd... So that's one thing that's changed between this game and Amnesia, but I don't know if it's for the better. I actually prefer the more... having more words to read. And hearing these stories, like the, the epic story I read near the beginning about the man who ate spiders and cut out his own tongue and whatnot. That was... That was really disturbing and intriguing to read. Just reading this person's journal. Reading what happened in his last... I don't know, year? Years? I think it was at least a year. It was at least a year. Yeah, just reading what happened in his last year, in the last year of his life. And knowing that I'm probably the only one who's ever going to read that. It was really emotional, and I liked it. It really resonated with me. So that's one thing I almost wish they didn't change. I like the wordiness of it, I really do. Now, is there anything else to mention? So I've talked about the physics system, it's pretty much stayed the same. Talked about the puzzle design, it's... Some of it stayed the same, the practical... The practical puzzles that you have to do involving physics and things like that are still in there. The kind of absurd shoved-in puzzles that don't make any sense definitely are removed in their future games. The wordiness of it has changed. A lot less text in their newer games, at least at least in Amnesia. I'm not sure about Black Plague or Requiem. For my memory on them is hazy. I feel like there's something I'm missing. Oh yeah, now I remember what I was going to say. Okay, it was related to the wordiness and the writing of the game. So one other kind of classical adventure game thing that they have is the fact that a lot of things in the environment you can look at and examine, and it gives you a text description written from the character's point of view of what he thinks about it. And that's a that's a very sort of classical adventure game thing. Most adventure games allows you allow you to click on things in the environment and hear descriptions of them. You know, to learn about the environment, and I really like that. I really do like that. I think that's great. There's a lot of things that you know, they weren't particularly relevant to what you had to do. They didn't help you solve puzzles, necessarily, but they're just interesting little bits of of backstory. Just to hear these descriptions about what you're looking at in the world, and having them written from the character's point of view, which also tells you a little bit about yourself, your character, Philip. I really like it. It makes me feel more a part of the world. And I can't remember whether Amnesia the Dark Descent has that. Can you examine random stuff in the world? Like you can in this game, to just get descriptions of it. I really can't remember. But, um, yeah, overall, the adventure game sort of influences on this game are in some ways really good and in some ways kind of bad. A puzzle, like the puzzle influence, not so good. In my opinion, the, uh, the wordiness of it and the fact that you can get descriptions on most items in the environment, or a large amount of items in the environment, very good. I really like that. So, yeah, that's what I was forgetting. In terms of the writing, uh, like the writing quality of the story, how interesting it is, uh, it's... It's pretty good. It's intriguing. It's definitely an intriguing story. But, as you can tell by the end, it's really unsatisfying, in the first episode at least. It just, it doesn't end at a good place, and... It just doesn't feel very satisfying at all. But it is an intriguing story. It feels kind of forced sometimes. Like the whole... The whole you get to the end and Red wants to die and you have to kill him and then there's the key inside. Like that just, it feels kind of forced to me. It's a little bit silly. It was still disturbing, don't get me wrong, it was disturbing. And I felt bad for Red. But... It just felt kind of gamey. Like, you you know, you, you've you had someone talking to you for a large part of the game, and then you finally get to him, and then you can't see him. 
and he wants you to kill him, and then at the end he delivers you a key that you need to progress. It's kind of silly. It almost turns red, and his death into, like, a key dispensary. Where his death is simply a way to progress in the game, and it doesn't feel right. That doesn't, that doesn't feel good. Something about that feels off. It's just kind of weird. And some of the stuff in the environment is pretty silly. You can definitely see some very gamey stuff. Like between the key dispensary of Red of Red's death and the super gamey kind of classical puzzles with the whole steam and the ridiculous factory and stuff like that. And then you also have the section where you have the chemical storage and getting to the chemical storage, you have the, you have to jump on all those little tiny pillars sticking up out of the ground and run across these boards. I mean, that seems so silly. Like, why would there be these little perfect rock platforms fairly evenly spaced, allowing you to jump across? That makes no sense. This entire place, like, blew up or something and caved in. And yet, what's left are these perfect little platforms that you can jump across. It's really silly. A lot of the environment felt... Not a lot, but some of the environment felt very silly, and, like, the whole section where you're running from the spiders, and you're going in these perfectly formed tunnels, and... Like, there just happens to be a gigantic boulder that you probably couldn't possibly push, but you can, to block the way back, and... You know, a lot of it just feels really silly. Uh, but not all of it does. A lot of it's really good. It's a creepy... Like, I'm mentioning a lot of negatives, but there's a lot about it I like. Uh, the game has really good sound design. Again, I love the physics system, I've already talked about that. I like the wordiness of it. Um, it's a very atmospheric world, even though... Certain things, like the combat and the silliness of some of it, kind of brings me out of it. There's still a lot of atmospheric stuff. A lot. A lot of backstory to read, very creepy environments. So, yeah, even... Even though there's quite a bit of immersion-breaking stuff, a lot of it's very good. It still felt like a very creepy world. And it was interesting to explore. And one other, one other thing I want to talk about, one other way in which I think it's actually more interesting to me than Amnesia the Dark Descent, is the environmental, sort of, yeah, I guess environmental design. Basically, the lo locations in which the game takes place are actually more interesting to me than Amnesia. Amnesia was... Well, I should, I should state right off the bat that I don't really care for castles all that much. I find them very boring. But... To go even deeper than that, most of Amnesia, to be frank, is... It, most of the environments are very much the same. They're just kind of like one dreary castle hallway after another. I love that game, but the environmental design is not particularly interesting. It's pretty boring and drab. And I actually felt like this one was more of an interesting place. I mean, we're talking about an underground sort of mine place that was then converted into some sort of a military base, and then converted into some sort of a research base. To me, that is way more interesting. Way more interesting to explore, and more visually interesting as well, than a dreary castle. So I actually liked the environments more. And I also like some of the stuff in the puzzles that take a bit of time. Like, I think the puzzles in this game are more complicated than in Amnesia. Amnesia really streamlined everything. And I don't think that's necessarily for the better. Some of the things you had to do in this game that required a bit of work, and like write, like writing stuff down on paper. A lot of what you did in this game required you to write stuff down on paper. Whereas in Amnesia, I don't think I ever had to do that, from what I can remember. And I, I really like writing stuff down on paper. I like having to work through problems. At least when the puzzles actually make sense and aren't forced. And a lot of the ones you did that required you to write stuff down on paper and they took a bit of time, a lot of them were not forced. They were good. They made sense. Like, for example, the Morse code. That was fun. You're, you're in a military bunker. Or a mine bunk, what, research base, whatever the hell you want to call it. You're in this place. And you find a manual that explains about uh, being a survivor and how to communicate using Morse code and stuff like that, and it gives you a manual telling you how to convert Morse code into characters, or characters into Morse code. That makes sense. You have a manual, and it makes sense why that manual would be in the world that tells you how to do Morse code. 
and then you receive Morse code from someone who is trying to communicate with you. It makes sense that this person who is trying to help you would want to communicate to you a passcode. Why exactly he's doing it through Morse code instead of just talking, I don't know, but for the most part it makes sense. And then you have to decode it. You have to use paper. You have to write down. You have to listen to it again and again. And you have to write down all the beeps and boops and whatnot. And then convert it into a passcode using this manual. I like that. It takes a bit of work. And I like that. I like having to work through problems. And I think that's missing in Amnesia. It's actually something that I miss. So it's kind of funny how their first game, Frictional Games' first game is... In many ways, worse. I mean, Amnesia is, I think, without a doubt, a much better game in general. Overall, it's better. But in some ways, Penumbra Overture, I actually like more. I like the environmental design more. I like the wordiness more. And some of the complexity of the puzzles, I like more. Yeah. It's really interesting to look back at what they've done in the past and how they've changed. So anyway, I think that's a good place to wrap up, yeah. That's probably like a good 20 minutes of talking or so. So, yeah, I'm just going to move right into Penumbra Black Plague and hopefully alleviate the dissatisfaction that I think everyone feels after seeing this ending, including me. It's a very unsatisfying ending, but thankfully I'm playing this game after every single part of it has already come out, so I can just move straight into the sequel. So I hope everyone has enjoyed my playthrough of Penumbra Overture, and if you want to watch it, I will see you on Penumbra Black Plague. Thank you for watching.